might be uh, fraud online. Well, uh, you'll do very well indeed to listen carefully to uh, our next speaker, who's from IBM. Would you please give a warm welcome to Paul Clandelin? Thank you very much. And uh, first, for, let me reassure you there will be no tests of your numeracy during my presentation. Furthermore, for the benefit of the audience, there will be no, new, um, no uh, mathematical formula will be displayed. You'll all be pleased to know, I, I'm sure. I work in the same areas as James um, from We Predict around analytics and around the use of big data. And uh, we have been, we've heard over the last uh, day or so many of the great advantages that big data can give to us as businesses in terms of connecting with our customers, understanding their behavior better, responding more quickly to their requirements, being more agile, and also some of the value of things like cloud delivery models to, to allow smaller and medium-sized uh, enterprises to take advantage of technologies that were previously only within the purview of um, very large global enterprises. So we can see how the, the changes in, in information technology that have taken place over the last couple of years are really broadening the scope of the possibilities available to you as business people to, to really optimize your businesses. However, the ugly sister of big data anal and analytics are cybersecurity and fraud. And one of the things that we, as a technology company who've been interested in cybersecurity for many years, one of the things we've noticed grow considerably over the last number of years has been the incidence of fraud and financial crime. And many of you will be familiar with the kinds of things you've seen happen online and the kind of scams you've seen. Uh, some of the Nigerian scams, for example, are very obvious. Uh, but a lot of things are much more subtle. Some of the... Th the, the, the findings and learnings that I'm going to talk to you about today might seem as if they apply only to large enterprises. I would warn you all, however, that over time, large enterprises are going to wise up. They're wising up already because of the huge cross, potential cost of, of fraud. And the fraudsters are going to move to the next available targets. And I would suggest to those of you in medium enterprises across all industries, you are probably the next available targets. Um, so, a little bit about fraud in the evolving fi financial crime landscape, and then maybe uh, some, some consideration of what's a smarter approach to addressing fraud across the enterprise. Um, first thing would, I would say to you is, is let's get our terms straight. I mean, fraud is a, is a de deliberate deception or misrepresentation which is intended to produce financial gain and is a crime. But there are, there are related examples. For example, James described the issue with the, um, the, the uh, car maintenance uh, companies in um, Montreal, where they were, that is effectively not a crime, it's abuse. But it's actually a very similar pattern. Same types of predictive analytics can be used to, to detect it. I'd also point you to financial crime. Uh, financial crime is not a very um, uh, hot topic. It tends to be quite an arcane one in that it really refers to money laundering. Now, why is money laundering important to us all in this room? Money laundering is the process of transmitting criminal funds across the money transmission networks. And what we're trying to do is to interrupt the flow of funding to terrorist groups, to drug cartels, to human traffickers. So there's a massive societal good involved in addressing money laundering. The interesting thing about money laundering is, however, the large organizations who are involved in these networks, it's not necessarily within their immediate financial interest to, to address them. Consequently, it's become the, the reign of, um, it's become the domain, if you like, of the regulator to, to design and enforce protocols to stop them happening, stop this happening. I would, um, however say to you that fraudsters are money launderers and money launderers are fraudsters. So the two are very tightly interlinked. We also see threat. We see uh, threat is more related to political gains. So when you see things like the cyber attacks that took, took place in Estonia a couple of years ago, some of the, um, the hacking attacks we've seen come out of um, government agencies in China, that's an example of the kind of threat. And finally, then there's the risk associated with the losses around 
operational security, financial losses, IT and security risks. The interesting thing, however, I'd like to point to about this, this chart is that over the last number of years, there's been a major change in how fraud is perpetrated online. And the major change is this. Previously, fraud was opportunistic and individualistic. So we saw employee fraud, for example, where somebody would falsify their expenses or somebody would um, uh, raise false in invoices with um, suppliers, for example. We've seen provider fraud where in healthcare provider situations, doctors might overbill, for example, for treatments that were never provided. So we've seen evidence of that around the NHS, for example. We've seen individual fraud where people overstate claims. And these all still go on, but what we have noticed over the last number of year, years, of the last five years, is that fraud is now increasingly collusive. And it's increasingly, increasingly it is the domain of organized crime. Uh, about 80% of fraud is collusive, and collusive fraud is much more complex to identify and to interrupt. Just some interesting numbers that, that um, somewhat shocking some of these around some of the, the instance of fraud and cybercrime. 12 new cybercrime uh, victims are reported a second around the world. Um, as I mentioned, 80% of fraud is now collusive fraud, organized fraud. And the interesting thing about organized fraud, as I'll show you in, in um, an example shortly, the interesting thing, it's like a marketplace. It's much like the legitimate marketplace in that there are suppliers, there are subcontractors. These are not all single amorphous gangs of people perpetrating their, the, these frauds. There are people who specialize in phishing attacks. There are, people who, there are people who specialize in compromising employees. There are people who specialize in, in, in running mule gangs. And all of these organize, organizations subcontract from each other. They operate rather like a, a, a normal, legitimate economic landscape. Fraud is no longer just the cost of doing business, certainly for large organizations and increasingly for small and medium organizations. Previously, insurance companies, for example, tended to treat claims cross, call, um, fraud as an operating cost. However, as we've seen the growth in fraud from 4.6% uh, of world G GDP to 5.2% over the last five years, this is decreasingly the case. The 100 billion refers to 100 billion in improper payments made by federal agencies in one year. 100 billion in improper payments. Extraordinary number. The 1.92 billion relates to a fine which HSBC received from a regulator in, in uh, the New York State for money laundry, laundering violations in Mexico, $1.92 billion they were fined. That's about to be, that's about to be hugely superseded. Uh, a French bank, rumors in the press indicate, is about to be fined up to $10 billion. So you can see that for large enterprises, certainly fraud is no longer the cost of doing business. It's now an important threat to their profitability. Customers' perceptions have also changed with the growth of social media and the growth of the informed um, customer. You must increasingly be aware of their propensity to change supplier if they lose trust in your ability to protect their data. One major US retailer had a, had a uh, data breach before Christmas. 100 million credit card numbers were stolen. That retailer suffered a drop of 45% in its brand perception in index over a weekend. Now, for anybody here who works in marketing, that is truly horrifying. Finally, 71% of customers have indicated in surveys that they would be willing to change their bank, their primary source of banking, if that bank were the subject of a data breach. So these are now serious problems for large companies and becoming increasingly so for smaller companies as well. When I talk about collusive fraud, let me explain to you, let me give you an example of the kind of networks that are operating here. Many of you will have heard of prepaid debit cards. Prepaid debit cards, a new form of payment whereby you can have a little 
rather like a, a traditional plastic debit card, uh, but you load it with money and you can only spend the money you load it on. Prepaid debit cards are no longer simply products produced by large banks, for example, but they're often produced for retailers for loyalty schemes. Some companies have used them in the past as payroll instruments. So they're becoming more widespread, and, and certainly small closed schemes have become more widespread. Well, in a particular instance, a small bank in the Middle East wanted to produce a prepaid card which they would use for the local population as a debit, debit instrument to, to reduce the need to carry cash for minor transactions. So there were strict limits on these cards in terms of how much could be loaded on them, how much, how, um, the maximum size of transactions, etc. But hackers breached the internal security of the bank in question. And in fact, we often think that hackers, when they breach internal security, they've done some very sophisticated attack on the external defenses of the organization. In fact, in this instance, they just compromised an employee. Um, and when you see the kind of profits of, uh, that, that people make from these schemes, you can see how easily it can be to breach your defenses in very old-fashioned ways. So hackers breached, breached the security of the bank, they stole the card numbers, they stole the pins, and they were able to manipulate the limits on the cards. The next thing that happened was, independently, a cybercrime organization and in a, uh, an unnamed third-party co country, independently of the hackers who had stolen the, the pin numbers, the, the cybercrime organization, let's call it in Abkhazia Stan for fun, in Abkhazia Stan, these people started to recruit a network of mules. And apologies to any students in the, in the audience, but students are the perfect target for mules. They have clean banking accounts, they often don't have a significant credit history, and so they're, they're really not looked at very closely when they go in to apply for an account to a bank. So they, the, the, the organization in question had in place a network of mules. They hadn't got a project in mind for them, but they had built up their network. They contracted with the hackers, uh, the people who had hacked the, the uh, Middle Eastern Bank, and they exchanged the data. The cybercrime organization then had every one of their mules go out and collect MagStripe cards. You probably all got a MagStripe card last night to enter your, your um, hotel room. Uh, in Europe, we use much more, uh, much more strictly controlled cards um, called EMV cards, but they still use MagStripe cards in lots of the world. And a MagStripe card is no more than the card key you used to get into your hotel room last night. So hackers, or sorry, the cybercrime organization then took the data they had gotten from the hackers and encoded it on many, many, many of these um, cards. Over the course of a weekend, they, dis they, they distributed them to their mule networks, and then they had those mule networks go out and use those cards, breaching their limits, to buy all manner of luxury items, sell them quickly on eBay, and extract the cash. The cash then flowed back to the cybercrime organization and, um, via the banks, hence the money laundering issue. So you can see that that is a very complex network, that is not the kind of thing that's going to be picked up very easily by the traditional approaches we've had to fraud, fraud prevention. It happens across lots of, of the, the channels with which we interact with the bank. The bank in question lost $47 million over the course of a weekend. Um, this is a small bank. That exactly the same could have happened to a small retailer who had used the same type of debit card technology as a loyalty scheme card, for example. So, very significant exposures appear here. And what are the reasons for this? Well, the first and most interesting reason is a narrow observation space. All our organizations tend to be siloed um, by function. So we have a personnel function, we have a manufacturing function, we might have a shipping function, we'll have a finance function, and they collect data for different reasons. And that data is always protected from, from outside viewing from other parts of the organization. The problem with this is that we are very limited in that, in that case to trying to detect fraud using the predictive models that James described with very small data sets. 
the reality is there's much more data uh, out there. One of the th interesting things that we and IBM did as we started to develop our thinking around this whole area was we went to the intelligence services and we asked them, how did they use this type of technology for understanding behavioral patterns? Uh, as an Irish person, I have to say, that always gives me a slight shiver down my spine. Um, so it was quite fun talking to MI, MI5 and MI6 about this. But the thing that they introduced us to was the, the, the idea of deep context. And by deep context, what they said was, we have certain amount of structured data about people we might be targeting. We might understand an address. We might understand that they phoned somebody else. We might have a certain amount of structured data. But the world is full of unstructured data. And as big data, big data uh, becomes more and more of a reality, the world is continuing to be flooded with more and more of this information. Places like blogs, social media, Twitter, etc. And what they, they, we really learned from the intelligence um, services was searching for this open source in, um, intelligence and automatically integrating it into our observation space really made a huge difference. Now we could make intelligent dis, um, decisions. So sharing across the enterprise is vital. And also bringing in this concept of open source intelligence from places like social media, um, places like Twitter, tw places like blogs, etc. The other issue is it's always been reactive versus proactive. James showed us some of the power of predictive analytics, and that is fantastic. And there are some organizations in, in the United Kingdom that do amazing things with predictive analytics. But it's no point identifying a suspected fraudster if you don't do something about them. And in many cases, they don't necessarily do something systematically about it. James, here's a shocking piece of information for you. Typical fraud detection systems in financial institutions return false positives of about 40 to 1. What that means for every fraudster we detect, we detect 40 who look suspicious but not, are not truly fraudsters. Now, can you imagine the amount of work involved in doing that? So one of the problems we have as big data um, increases our observation space is building algorithms that allow us to manage that data. Uh, it leads us on to an interesting concept called enterprise amnesia. Traditional behavior and pr predictive analytics are going to start to run out of steam um, because of the vast volumes of unstructured data that they're being asked to, to deal with. Um, we recently did a piece of work with Walmart in the US where we discovered that out of 1,000 employees, they had hired two whom they had previously had arrested in their stores for theft. And that's very typical of the kind of problem you run into because of this lack of an enterprise view of the data. So from a fraud perspective, you really need to take a high level view of the, of the data. So this is what I, I'm suggesting to you all to th perhaps think about as you think about how do I address this emerging problem in my organization. First of all, elevate the agenda. This is a board level conversation. It's not a finance conversation. It's not a manufacturing conversation. It's not a maintenance conversation. It is a board level enterprise wide discussion. If you don't approach it on an enterprise basis, you will find that you're being attacked by fraudsters from multiple different channels. And because you're not sharing that information, you cannot see those patterns as they emerge. The second is act with inside superiority. And by that, I mean, use the best available predictive analytics, the best available um, behavioral analytics, the kind of thing that, that we predict build to identify suspicious transactions, but to identify them with sufficient confidence um, that you don't have these massive false positives rates that you can never deal with. And you also have to act upon these suspicions. That, that means you have to investigate them. And one of the key techno technologies that was briefly mentioned by James was visualization. Data visualization is essential if you're going to look at and try and find where fraud is actually happening in your organization. Looking at rows and rows of Excel um, spreadsheets is never going to answer the question for you. And the last then is adapt with agi agility. And adapt with agility means Build up the financial intelligence that comes your way. And over time, mine it for historical patterns that you may have missed. One of the things that we know about fraudsters and money, money launderers is, boy, do they adapt quickly. They adapt incredibly quickly. You shut down one channel, they're going to appear in another. 
shut down one, one um, typology of fraud, they're going to appear with another. And so you need to be constantly mining your, your financial intelligence to identify new patterns that you can update your predictive models, your behavioral models with. I think this is quite important. People think, um, people believe that security and authentication is, is the key. Cybersecurity is everything. It's only the first layer of defense. And this to all medium and small enterprises out there. Your, one of your major defenses after cybersecurity, after being able to identify and verify that somebody accessing your system is truly who they say they are. A key one is policies, practices, and procedures. Make sure your rules don't allow access to um, financial applications too easily, that payments out of the company are not authorized without multiple levels of sign-off. Uh, make sure your business applications and workflow take account of those kind of things. And finally then, build in detection, uh, engines, investigation engines, prediction engines to allow you to detect, respond to, and uh, recover fraud. Last point, um, this is somewhat, um, this is, uh, somewhat um, controversial in the financial worlds, but I think it's absolutely the case. Fraud, risk, and security are tightly interlinked. Um, they share common information and traditionally they've been split apart as different silos and operating from different places. Um, you need to share this information, you need to bring these organizations together and you need to make sure that they have common goals, common missions, common tool sets and common understandings of what they're looking for. IBM has a very extensive, um, a very extensive research in this area. I would direct you, if you're interested in, in finding out more about what are the emerging threats, um, both in fraud and um, in cybersecurity, that you go to the IBM Web Force. There are two organizations in which you might be interested. The first, and I do apologize for the sub-Tom Clancy nomenclature, the first is called Red Cell. And Red Cell is a small organization that, that, cons that, that constantly uh, examines emerging fraud threats across all industries. So it's a free source of research to see what might be, might, might be emerging and what you might need to respond to. And the second is X-Force, and X-Force does a similar job around cybersecurity, identification and verification, and emerging threats in that area. So if you're interested in understanding what are the trends, those are two sources of in intelligence to which I direct you immediately. And at that point, I'd say thank you very much for your time and your attention. Please do feel free to get the, uh, the charts. If there's something you'd like to follow up, please feel free to contact me directly yourself. Thank you, everybody.